So um, I'm Isabou Iqbal and I'm joining you from the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I'm just a few minutes away from the Vancouver Point Grey campus, but I'm at, at home today. And I'm an educational developer at the Center for Teaching, Learning and Technology, and I very frequently support instructors um, around developing their teaching philosophy statements and or developing or revising their teaching philosophy statements. Um, Sue, so pass it over to you. Great. Thanks, Isabeau. And welcome everyone to the session today. Uh, my name is Sue Hampton. My pronouns are she and her. And I am also joining from, I am today up at UBC Vancouver, traditional and ancestral territory of the Musqueam people, um, sitting in Ike Barber Learning Center today and I'm also one of the educational consultants at the Center for Teaching Learning and Technology and I get the privilege of working with Isabo and Judy on a lot of different um, a different work that we do on course design and teaching development so I'll pass it over to Judy yes Judy here, um, again, I work with Isabel and Sue on a number of different projects and different type of workshops too. I am facilitating joining you from my home in the unceded traditional and ancestral land of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Coast Salish people. I will be facilitating another workshop later today. That's why it, it's a little bit easier for me to stay home today. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm going to start to share my slides uh, momentarily. Just want to make sure that you all know. Please be com like feel comfortable to keep your videos on or off, whatever uh, it is that you need to to stretch and move if you if you need to. Um, we are going to, or not we, you are going to be spending some time in breakout rooms. And if you are comfortable at that point, turning on your video, um, I think it's always nice when you're in a small setting to, to have them on, but again, uh, do what it is that you, um, yeah, you need to, to take care of, of yourselves. And if you have any questions at any point, um, there will be time where you know, we'll ask for questions, but if things come up for, for you, please put it in the chat and whoever's not facilitating will have an eye out um, for any questions that, that you have. So here are uh, objectives for today. So this is really an introductory session for the teaching philosophy statement. And so by the end of this workshop, you should be able to explain the purposes of the teaching philosophy statement describe characteristics of an effective teaching philosophy statement, identify belief statements, and also identify statements of evidence. This is really kind of the, the bulk of our, our session today. And then also um, determine next steps in developing your own teaching philosophy statement. The purposes, characteristics of um, teaching philosophy statements, then move into beliefs and evidence and end up with the, the next steps. Right, so to get a sense of where you're at with your own teaching philosophy statement, we are going to ask you to do a very quick annotation activity. And um, here you are. What is the current state of your teaching philosophy statement is the is the question. And if you could use the stamp tool, so annotate and stamp and kind of and put yourself wherever it is that you feel <laughs> your teaching philosophy statement you know, falls into, like either you don't have one, or maybe you have a draft um, or perhaps you have a final for now version. So just take a few moments and put a stamp there. All right, so we've got people at kind of all different different stages, which is great. And I think that regardless of what stage you're at, and you can keep the annotations going, you're welcome to do that. Um, regardless of what stage you're at, I think you'll find value in, uh, in the examples that you're gonna take a look at and the conversation today. Uh, we are curious if you're on the, uh, the side of, I don't have one yet, and you're willing to share, we'd like to hear just very briefly, like what are some of the biggest barriers that you're, you're facing in getting one started? You can raise your hand or you can simply unmute and um, let us know. What are some of the barriers that you're facing if you are in the category of, I don't have one yet? There are not necessarily any barriers. I just haven't needed it yet. 
You haven't what? Sorry. I just haven't needed it yet. Yeah, you haven't needed it yet. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good reason. <laughs> Thanks for that. What about folks who have one, a final for now version? What has helped you get to that stage in addition to um, a deadline, a necessary deadline? What are some of the things you can either put in the chat or you can unmute yourself? What has helped you get to your final for now stage if you have one? We have someone saying that seeing some examples. Oh, great. In the chat. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Sue, did you grab a did you grab a screen capture of this? Okay, super, thank you. All right, so your philosophy is, is really about your approach to teaching. So I wanna get grounded in that for just a, a moment. And as you think about your teaching, think about one word or two words that communicates something about your approach to teaching, something that really represents a key piece of um, your teaching. It could be student-centered, or maybe that it's um, that you offer choice. It doesn't have to be a fancy pedagogical word, but just something that you think uh, captures uh, something about your approach to teaching. And please put that in the chat. Give that just three more seconds. Think of a, a word or a few words. Great, thanks. And kind of Think, but we're going to come back to this word a little bit later, most likely. So, um, well, super, but more coming. Great. All right. So, we are going to take a moment to look at uh, definitions and purposes of the teaching philosophy statement. So, here's a definition from the literature The teaching philosophy is a written statement that communicates your beliefs about teaching and learning and includes evidence from your teaching to show how you translate these beliefs into practice. And we are gonna be spending a lot more time on this um, in, uh, in this session. Purposes um, are definitely for academic positions. This is really typical that it's asked for. It's part of your teaching portfolio or teaching dossier. We use the words interchangeably in this session tenure and promotion reviews, and also for teaching award applications, it's often a requirement. And I want to acknowledge that uh, what's listed here is very much about the performative aspect of being an academic, right? These, um, these items here about you being evaluated or assessed by somebody else um, and the teaching philosophy statement is often part of that context. However, there's also other purposes, and that is that you can use your teaching philosophy statement as part of your ongoing reflections. It's a way to express yourself, right, either to students, to colleagues, to um, out people outside of yourself. And it definitely says uh, something, it communicates aspects of your identity as a teacher. So uh, the good thing about the teaching philosophy statement and also the challenging aspect is that uh, there is a lot of flexibility in this document in terms of what you put in, how, you know, what, even what it looks like, so the content. So um, I want to speak briefly about the characteristics it can be a standalone document. So sometimes an application will add, a, a job posting will ask only for your teaching philosophy statement. And then it definitely is often, or when you're creating a dossier, it's part of a part of a dossier. It's usually right at the beginning of your, of your dossier. When I'm reading a teaching philosophy statement and asked to review, I expect to see one or two pages. That seems to be um, at the two is the, the upper limit. Definitely um, in terms of the literature and what I expect to see, it's written in the first person narrative. So I, you know, versus Judy takes an active learning approach to her teaching. So written from the I, it, it would absolutely have your beliefs about teaching. Um, some people might use the word values instead of beliefs. We'll use beliefs here. And then include concrete examples of how these beliefs are enacted. And we'll be spending more time on that uh, today. So this is what we are calling 
evidence in the context of this session, um, the concrete examples are the evidence. We're using that interchangeably here. I also expect your teaching philosophy statement to be grounded in your discipline. So uh, there's a balance here between avoiding uh, you know, jargon, but also being able to write from a disciplinary perspective. And I um, usually recommend that you uh, include, incorporate maybe one or two scholarly references. It's not necessary. And I will say that people reading your teaching philosophy statement, um, I don't know, I haven't heard of this, although there are rubrics for teaching philosophy statements, I don't think that um, it's customary to be using, like for the evaluator to be using a rubric um, when they are reading through your, your teaching philosophy. So I think that including scholarly references is good practice. It shows that you engage with the pedagogical literature, but it's, uh, I don't, I wouldn't say it's a requirement. All right. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Sue. So as Isabel mentioned, belief statements really are at the heart of the teaching philosophy statement. So we're going to be spending the next 30 minutes or so digging into belief statements. And you're gonna get the opportunity to read and discuss some sample teaching philosophy statements to really notice the ways in which those beliefs are communicated. So it's really important to articulate your beliefs in this statement, right? You need to be able to um, really articulate your own beliefs and communicate your beliefs to the reader about teaching, about learning, about how knowledge is constructed in an educational context. So this articulation about your beliefs really does help to convey your sincere commitment to teaching and learning. And so some of the ways in which these beliefs are communicated and how they kind of show up in the document um, are they're communicated perhaps as goals, perhaps as expectations, or maybe as value statements. So for example, the way um, you might want to specify what values you hold about teaching and learning, or perhaps your expectations that you hold uh, for students or of yourself, um, or perhaps the goals that you strive for, things that you're always aiming for in educational settings. So all of these are really, really specific to you and um, in many ways, highly personal. And that it really is um, kind of the purpose of this statement. So I'm gonna give an example here next. Uh, this is a sample belief statement. This is from Sarah Levitt from Creative Writing. And she writes, I assume that all of my students are capable of making comics and that their individual points of view and voices are valuable and worth sharing. Right, so here you'll notice she has this belief in kind of the efficacy of her students to, to do the work to create those, those comics that are part of her classes. And I also wanna point out um, in this statement in particular and in many belief statements that you're gonna read, they don't always need to start with the sentence stem, I believe, right? Here they kind of can be worded in many different ways. Here she has, I assume, maybe you'll see I value or I expect things like this, right? So when you're reading some of these samples shortly, um, kind of be attentive to those belief statements. They don't always need to start with the word, I believe. So then a couple of tips for you, kind of guiding principles as you are doing your writing, as you're working on um, your statement. So here we have the picture of this person hiding behind with their face behind a book. So really here we're saying, don't hide your belief statements from the reader. Right. Don't make the reader kind of try to guess what your beliefs are. The purpose of the of the document of the statement really is to be explicit about what your beliefs are. OK, um, the second point we have is to avoid cliches. Right. Sometimes we'll read things like I'm really passionate about teaching or um, I love I love teaching things like this. When you, you know, you can kind of think about those kinds of cliche statements that you hear often, try to probe yourself a little bit deeper, right? What do I mean, for example, when I say that I'm passionate about teaching? What does that mean? And try to be a bit more specific, go a bit deeper into what you mean. Um, the next one is about jargon. 
So whether it's disciplinary jargon or kind of pedagogical kind of buzzwords, maybe words like innovative or experiential, right? These are kind of terms and words we hear all the time um, in the educational environment, but these words mean different things to different people. So it's really important if you're using those kinds of terminology that you take the time to define what these mean to you. That goes back to the statement really being quite personal for you. And then the last point we, I wanna point out is about acronyms. Sometimes people in their, in their disciplines or in their departments, they are using a lot of acronyms, but be sure for your reader, because whoever's reading might not be, um, you know, might not know all those acronyms. So just spell those out first for your reader, expecting they might not know. Okay, so now for the next piece, with that really brief kind of opening of belief statements, we're going to give you the chance to read some belief statements. Um, so we sent this, we're giving, we're gonna put in the chat in a moment, um, five samples from five different disciplines. And we're gonna ask you to keep your videos off and we're gonna give you five minutes, we'll set the timer to choose one of the five. Okay, decide, you might wanna choose the one whose discipline is kind of closest to yours or whatever, however you decide to do it. But in the five minutes, choose one that you're gonna kind of skim through and read. And as you're reading, what we want you to be attentive to is um, the belief statements that you are reading. So you can use the highlighting tool in Word or underline, whatever, whatever you'd like to do. Um, and then after this, what we're gonna do after the five minutes, we're going to come back together as a group. And then we're gonna give you some, a time in a breakout room with a small group of colleagues who have read the same one. And you'll get the chance to discuss uh, the belief statements that you, that you were reading. Okay, so there Isabeau has put in the chat the, um, a Word document that has the five samples on it, the same one that we had sent earlier by email. So I'm just gonna check if there's any questions before we let you give you the five minutes to read. So everyone, we'll welcome you back here into the space. Um, we are getting ready for the next step. So it'd be great to know that you're still back here with us, whether you can send us a emoji or turn on videos or anything like that. Um, great, I got a whole bunch of thumbs up coming down, which is awesome. A couple of videos on, bunch of videos on, great. Thanks everyone. So we know in that five minutes, you might not have had time to fully read the whole statement and that's totally fine, but just enough to kind of get, get the flavor of it and um, you know, kind of get you started. Of course, you're gonna have those samples now after the session so you can later look through all of them um, at, your own, at your own leisure. So what we're gonna do next then is we're gonna move on to step two. So in step two, we're gonna get you into small, small breakout rooms, rooms of three, maybe four people max. And you'll have a chance, you're gonna be in this room with someone who, or people who read the exact same uh, sample that you just finished reading, okay? And you'll get the chance to ch kind of chat through um, those statements that you were, were thinking about. So what were the phrases, what were the words or sentences that communicated the instructor's belief? So you're really trying to zero in on kind of the language, right? Around those st belief statements and anything else perhaps if you have time in your groups, anything else you might've noticed about this example. So we're gonna pop those two questions that you see on the slide into the chat so that you're gonna have those with you when you go off to breakout rooms. So here's how we're gonna um, facilitate the breakout room. You're gonna have 12 minutes there. What we're gonna do in a moment, Judy's gonna open the breakout rooms and you will self-select which room to go into. So what that means, you should see now the breakout room button down below in your Zoom bar. You can see a series of, um, of the different rooms. There's multiple rooms because what we're hoping you can do is watch as people join. If a room um, gets to three people, join a different room. So we really wanna make these small spaces, okay? This might take a moment for everybody to kind of get into the right room and move yourself around. And we also are asking if you could try to remember which breakout room you're in, because you in the second half of this, we're going to put you back, back with the same group of people. 
Okay, so you can feel free now. You can see, I see a couple people going off into choose the room, um, the discipline that you were reading. If you see three people, choose the next option and somebody else will join you there. All right, I see people joining now. That's awesome. If anybody cannot see the button or needs help getting into a room, please let us know in the chat which room we should add you to. Thank you very much. So we just spent some time to look at belief about our teaching and students learning. And now this is the time to show people that you, you don't just think about this. You, you, we are telling people exactly the concrete steps that, do, that you're doing, that you enact your belief. And um, yes, so we need to be very convincing. And so I need to advance my slide. Now that I have the power, because in the past, this is a new update. So this is a new update on Zoom. So we really wanted to make it very clear. We don't want to let our readers to fish around and look for it. How do we know that you believe in problem-based learning and having partnership? So we need to make it very clear, very convincing. It has to be very concrete and show people the examples. And other things that I would like to stress that this is not about what you believe or what you aspire to do. I want to build community. We want people to know that how you build community. I build community by doing this, by having this. So we want real action, not just what you want to do and what you want to become. So really concrete examples. Let's just talk, look, look at one example again, just one because of time. So in this statement, so some of you also read um, this, I believe that students benefit from a variety of instructional method. This is the belief statement. So we continue to see a paragraph. So in the blue statement there, I use different learning strategies that depends on the material being taught and the focus of the class. So this is what we said, what he's doing. He used different learning strategies to in different um, exam, in different, in different um, classrooms. So then I am just going to be very nitpicking here for me. And I heard you from in the chat that you also disagree. There's some disagreement on how much depth that you would like to go into. And in the very beginning, we also talk about is this teaching philosophy, teaching philosophy statement a standalone document. If it's a standalone document, I, as a reader, I would feel that this is not concrete enough. Okay. However, if, if this is a document, this is just the beginning of a dossier, there will be examples, there will be more concrete examples of the type of activities. For example, I, I am really, really curious to know what is the learning environment? What is the strategies that we is actually trying to do for the type of classroom. Um, what is the learning goal? What is what are students going to learn? Is it knowledge, skills, or attitude? And what is the focus of the class? Is it a very reflective class, an active class? So I I would like to see more, but I understand that if this is a, only a standalone statement, one pager, two pager, that may not be enough room. Okay, so I would like to, we are going to have another exercise and we are going to put some questions in the chat. And um, so we will, these are the questions that we will ask you to go back into the class in the same breakout room. So that's why we asked you to try to remember where you are, but don't worry, I, I took notes, so I remember where you are where you were. So go back into the same breakout room and look at the same statement. Now compare your notes with your peers. And I know that you've already started um, talking about this. So there's already some disagreement in some room, but not every room, because um, um, I know there's some room with only two people, some room with um, four. 
So we would like you to start to identify the evidence that aligns with the um, statement. And what, what, what do you, as a reader, is it concrete and specific enough for you? Can you see the writer in action, the instructor in action? And if you have time, think about how you're going to, what changes you're going to make. So I'm going to open all the rooms again. Thing. And then you have about 12 minutes to go into your rooms and meet your colleagues again. I would like to hear, I am worth read in the chat, some of the evidence that you saw um, in the teaching philosophy statement. Also like to ask for a volunteer who will be brave enough to turn on the video and amuse yourself and share an example that is so compelling that you go, wow, this is so a lie. It works with the belief. It's so it, it's it's not my belief, but it, it shows the alignment, the belief and the evidence. Come on. I am really good with silence. I can't wait. Jenna, thank you. I'm not good with silence. <laughs> Makes me very uncomfortable. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess um, Simone and I were chatting about Jonathan Barrett's um, teaching philosophy statement. And there's not one part that really sang in terms of, oh, that's the best evidence I've ever seen that relates to it. But throughout, he really ties um, all of his belief statements to how he's enacted it in the classroom. Like it's it's really weaved uh, well throughout the whole whole statement. Um, but we both agreed that they were, the, they were more um, kind of generic examples and not very specific, uh, concrete, like this is exactly how I did it in this one classroom. So we thought there could be room for him to expand on that if he wanted to, but we're also curious on the point you were making before about how maybe if it's part of a dossier, you don't need to go into that level of detail. So yeah, that was just interesting to see. And we both agreed that we would probably want to put a little bit more specific detail about how we enacted it. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jenna, for sharing, for, for volunteering. Yes. I was looking for the lower the hand button. I couldn't find it myself. So thank you, Jenna, for lowering your hand yourself. And thank you for sharing. Sue, can I pass the torch back to you? Um, I think it goes, yes. So here we want to open, just open the floor about for any questions, right? Anything that came up in your groups, anything you're thinking about as you're maybe getting getting prepared to work on your own, maybe update yours, maybe get started. Any questions? We're just opening the floor here at this point. Yeah, Kristen. I think one of the questions that came up in our group that predominated both of the breakout sessions was, does the teaching philosophy statement need to stand alone? Mm. So, I mean, we had some, you know, there was some disagreement or discussion about what is evidence which you know Jenna had just brought up, what level of evidence is required, how specific does it need to be? I mean, and I think the question we came back to was, you know, should this stand alone? Because if it doesn't, and then the person is going to go look at my CV and see the examples, then how clear, how specific, how evidence-oriented does it need to be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Yeah. And I think if we go back to what Judy had mentioned earlier, thinking about whether it is standalone or whether it is part of a larger piece like the dossier, then, you know, you can adapt and make those changes around the specificity that you need to. But I'll, I'll, I saw Isabeau, you unmuted for a sec. So I'm going to pass it to you for any thoughts. Yeah, equal eye, Sue Hampton. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, to what you what you just said, Sue, and I think yeah, it really depends because if you're only being asked for a teaching philosophy statement and your CV is part of an application, you want to make sure that that teaching philosophy um, gives your reader a sense of who you are and whether you'll fit 
right, with within the context. So if they're seeing, you know, sort of, again, like a, if the disciplinary norms are around, I don't know, I don't know what, like if there's a lot of collaboration in, in that and you're somehow demonstrating that, that that's not um, part of your approach, then that would give them some information, right? Because this is really, often it's about, it's about fit. Yeah, it's about competence and qualifications and all that, but really ultimately it's a, it's a lot about fit. Um, and then uh, the piece around, you know, how do you, how do you, what is that kind of that right happy place between being specific, but also you only have one or two pages. And so the way I usually talk about it when I'm giving people some feedback, when I've been invited to give feedback on a teaching philosophy statement is um, like, uh, paint me a picture, give me a snapshot of what it, it if I were flying on the wall, you know, in your in your classroom and your in your teaching, what would this look like? So again, back to uh, collab, you know, I take a, whatever I incorporate collaboration in, in my teaching. I mean, that could mean like a million different things. So I want to know what does it look like for for you, just in a in a few sentences. Um, and again, you don't need to have a whole bunch of these examples, but because this is not aspirational, as Judy was pointing out, like this is your teaching philosophy is about how you teach now. And that's why it's also a really good reflective document is because you'll be able to see how much your teaching changes and evolves or over over time um, is to, yeah, to give to give that snapshot and to make sure that whatever you're stating is important to you. Um, is actually reflected in in your practice as a as an instructor. Hopefully that helps. Yes, Sally, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I was in a group of three and we discussed Reed Ferber, the kinesiology one, and I thought that might be a good example of what you were just saying, but in a different um, from a different perspective, uh, where what I'm hearing and uh, correct me if I'm wrong um, to my teammates uh, 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 Vincent and Mira, but because uh, you know, that's an example of one where it's a very succinct, um, it's quite aspirational, perhaps, although it's not stated that way. There are no specifics of who this person is. So whether it's a standalone or part of a dossier where you can read more into it later, uh, first of all, there's no um, reference to something that we might see in the dossier, nothing specific. And I don't know who this person is. I just read a very nice summary of what one should do what one thinks one should do. And I, I liked, and I think it worked with the, my team when I said, well, who are you when I read this? I wanna know who you are. It will be reflected in every way you um, craft it, you know. Uh, yes, the difficulty is doing it in a, in, in a concise fashion, but I wanna hear you, who are you? Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Sally. Yeah, absolutely, right? So thinking through the need for some of those specifics, right? Because the reader really does want to get a sense of who you are in the classroom and kind of wants to walk away, even if it's a one pager, having, having that sense. Yeah, thanks for that, Sally. Uh, Andrea, over to you. Uh, yeah, we actually had the same one, Reed Ferber, who, I actually think might have been one of my professors many years ago um, in my undergrad. Um, and we had the exact same sort of comment that like, the first time we read it, we really appreciate just how clearly written it was or how like non-jargony, but then when we went back and tried to ask that question of like, who is this person? Or could we like picture them teaching? Um, we had a lot of questions like we couldn't answer it as a standalone if you consider it a standalone document um but the one question i guess like that we also had was um how what are some ways that you can communicate like not just examples but a bit of the context in which you're teaching and if you think about a teaching statement or a teaching philosophy as like, you know, my values probably don't change from one semester to another or from one classroom to another, but mm -hmm. often the context that I'm teaching does change. I, I might teach 200 students 
who are first year students in a required class in one semester. And then, you know, the next semester I'm teaching 40 students who have selected my class because they've got a very particular interest or like reason to be there. So like, what are some of the ways you might be able to, um, or is that, I guess, is that important? Like when you say, can you picture this person? How do you convey a bit, like whether the environment or the like particular purpose of teaching a course versus a broader like philosophy or approach to teaching? Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent question, Andrea. So I, I will, I will respond, but then I'm going to open it here to Judy and Isabo, and maybe even Sally, who has her hand up too, because everyone might have uh, some ideas here. I think that painting that context piece in the opening can be really, really important in kind of um, sharing a bit more about, you know, and you might have different ways that you approach those different kinds of classes, which can come out as part of your philosophy and the way that you think about what you're doing with different learners different audiences and and different classes so i think there is definitely a way for you to weave that that through the statement but i'm going to open the floor here and see if my co-facilitators or sally also want to respond let's open it up to sally and then uh yeah i, I think you just stated it yourself um the very fact that you recognize it and state that andrea that uh I teach in multiple settings and it immediately brings the issue of partnership. You know, in these settings, you're different, the, both yourself and the individual, the learner uh, is in a different context and would behave differently. The very fact that you would recognize that as a statement uh, that I, you know, first of all, let your audience know you teach in multiple settings, <laughs> which impacts how you approach it, but they also, it impacts how they learn. I think just stating those things tells me a lot about you. You're, you, you, you recognize you're a different person, different settings. You have uh, different resources available to you, uh, time-wise, tool-wise. There are things you can't do in a big class. You can't do, you know, all of that comes out just by you stating that I already like you. <laughs> you're, you're thinking you have experience, right? Uh, so maybe it doesn't need to be that specific so that, under every setting you provide an example, but the very fact that you stated it tells me something about you, a quite important thing about you. So uh, my question just comes out of the comment just uh, I received right now. Uh, so how, uh, I know that we, we should be specific and objective about the examples that we give or the, uh, the evidence, but how, uh, how, are we, how should we be specific about ourselves? are we introducing our this is yeah I, this is not a a cv or a resume or it comes as part of my dossier for tenure promotion so uh, am i uh, giving my background here as well or is it is it uh, i know that it it, it, it would give uh, some information about me anyways but how specific should I be about my background, my uh, setting of the class, or my setting? You know, that's, uh, I, do we need to make the distinction or not? Yeah, it's a good question. Thank you. Um, I, I'll start and then we'll see what others want to add to it. So if this is for tenure and promotion, this is not a, definitely not a standalone. And so you want to be careful about not duplicating um, uh, too much between your dossier, your CV, you know, your teaching philosophy statement. When I, when you're thinking about uh, an entire package, what you want to be thinking about is um, kind of setting the stage for what is going to be elaborated on in your dossier. So, for example, if you were to state that uh, there is a particular approach, right, like if you were in your teaching philosophy statement to put, let's just take the example that was given, is that you use different approaches and modalities depending on the, the you know, the specifics of the class and the learners. And then I were to read your dossier and it looks kind of like a cookie cutter approach. You know, you take the same kind of uh, approach regardless of whether it's 
20 students or 200 students, uh, whether it's an elective or, or not, then I might say, well, hmm, that there's, this is like, this is inconsistent, right? This is not congruent with what was in the teaching philosophy statement. So you don't have to give extensive to your background question. You only have one or two pages. Um, people are reading it as part of, you know, a bigger thing. You want to give them a sense of what you care about as, as a teacher and how you promote student learning and on what kind of basis you're, you know, you're taking that. Um, and it, as I mentioned, like the cynical part of me, like your reader isn't necessarily, um, they don't have a checklist necessarily about you know what they're looking for a lot of us are just doing this um kind of <laughs> without a real process um so and and then i guess the final piece is always 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 get other people to read through your materials before you you submit because there will be departmental and disciplinary norms things in your faculty that are kind of uh just part of how people do things that uh it's always good to get some input from other people i'll stop there thank you so and much open it up to others so there's a question in the chat about um um if i'm very early in the career then don't have a lot of experience or example can the teaching philosophy statements be inspirational my, I'm going to chime in first, and then I welcome everyone to share what you think. Uh, I would say yes, it can be inspirational, but my biggest my my worry from what I've seen in the past is that you are aspired to do too much, and that as a reader, I'm like, are you sure you can do that? What if you're going to teach a first year level course, like as man, Andrew mentioned, with 200 students, it's a required course. Are you, are you sure that you can answer meet with every single student and have a co have a coffee with them every day? Like I just inspiration always good, but also make sure that it's doable and um and yes, so not to over promise. And so I think in the end, having some concrete life experience let's say i work with a mentor and this is how my mentor taught and i would like to replicate some of the the work that my mentor has done in the past that might be better than just being like i wanted to talk to every single student in in my spare time um just worry that it'll be over promising yeah so that's my thought on that any other tips for for someone who is new in the career, or do we have other questions? I'll just say, um, if you're new and you don't have too much experience and you're, you're applying for a, a position where teaching is required, I'm stating the obvious here, but get as much experience as you can, even if it's a guest, uh, you know, just a, a guest lecture or one off, you can do those and um, and that will give you more insight into into your approach too. But it's also about providing concrete examples, right? What what your former supervisors done to that align with your own value and how you see that the evidence actually promotes student learning. I think in the end, it's, we, we need to go back to that student learning piece. Okay, thanks so much everyone for those really um, insightful questions and the conversation and dialogue. I am going to pass it over to Isabeau to um, get you thinking about your next steps. Thanks, Sue. Thank you for all your fabulous questions and input in the chat. That's great. Um, so uh, at this stage, we're getting close to, to the end. And we had said one of our learning objectives was that we would give you a moment to think about what your next step is. And that could be that you want to block out time in your calendar, or maybe you want to reread the samples, whatever it is, but take a few seconds and get concrete because there's no point in coming to a session and then not applying it. Well, anyway, that's clearly my personal philosophy uh, coming out there. So just on your own, take a moment.
What are you going to do? When are you going to do it? So if you need more time to think about that, and of course, please take, play, take the time. Um, you may also want to go back to that word, those beautiful words at the beginning of the session where you um, added one or two words about your approach to change. You might want to flesh that out. So, oh, great. Thank you, Sally, for, for this. Um, so we are going to formally close this session now with a big thank you to all of you for your engagement through throughout and also to remind you that the three of us are available to provide support around teaching philosophy statements and what that typically looks like is with plenty of advance notice if you uh, reach out to us and you say you know i'm working on mine would you be able to uh to to look it over provide any thoughts a reminder that none of us are faculty members we are staff so we bring that and we're educational developers who've been working in this field for a really long time so we bring that um, but as I mentioned a few moments ago, always uh, I always recommend that you ask one of your colleagues to to review your your work. Um, so so thank you. So an invitation to come back to us. A thank you for being here today. And we also have a very 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 short survey that um, that invites your feedback. And it would be so helpful for us to get your feedback on this session or any additional resources that you know that you'd like to see from ctlt judy has put the link there um, if you could please go to that now take one or two minutes to to do that but we will officially close this now and we'll stick around for just a, a few minutes and then close the zoom room in in about five minutes thank you everybody thanks everyone great to see you today